Good morning, Chair. Chair, we've got sufficient members to start and um, the Deputy Minister is present. But I am audible enough and I am visible enough. When I try to put in my background, uh, hey, you're muted. I'm muted. No, no, we can hear you. Okay. When I try to put in my background, there is that shaky. You're still muted. Why? Madeline, no, she's not we muted. Can we can hear the chairperson. We can hear. Okay, okay. Um, honourable members of the Portfolio Committee of Public Works and Infrastructure, um, the Deputy Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure, the Minister in her absence, the team that supports this portfolio committee from the parliament, the observers, and all those that are watching our meeting, uh, good morning. Um, today, it's the last day of what we call in South Africa, the August month. And tomorrow we will be on what we call our heritage month. But as much as when we started this month, we indicated the challenges that are still facing women and children in our country. But he will always appreciate that amongst all the things that it has seen to do this country, it decided that there must be a women's month. But we know that it's not something that came out of nothing. It is the battle that was waged by our grandmothers, our sisters, our mothers on the 9th of August, 1956, when they clearly indicated that the role of women is not only in the kitchen, it is also on the boardrooms, on the streets, fighting the struggle of emancipation of women. Today, we're going to deal with it. one of the direct trades in public works, the expanded public works program, EPWP. But we know, as all where we were sitting, that the majority of the beneficiaries of that program are women. But are they really benefiting in the form of are they getting the necessary skills that we said they must be transferred to them? In fact, even when this program was started, there was a view that as much as it is a temporary, if you can say so, but there must be skills transferred. Ah, the municipality that are getting grants from public works through this program, accounting, the departments, is there a uniform way of ensuring that there is a uniform way of accounting for the recording in progress that are received through this program? We know that we have received the reports that indicated challenges in some of the departments in some of the municipalities that are receiving this grant. So today, the report that we will be getting will be talking to some of the issues that I've mentioned and more on what the department is going to be reporting to us. With those few words, honorable members, and those that are from the executive, the acting DG, as, as we had when we asked uh, that what is happening to DG advocate Sam Vukela, the minister said that uh, she is going to brief us. But uh, we had uh, on the same week on the news that uh, she is, he is taking early retirement 
through an agreement that has been reached. So we would like to know, uh, DM, Ms. Kivit, that who is now our acting uh, DG in that uh, the DG now has taken. Maybe it's his last day today, we don't know. But uh, we hope that at least as this portfolio committee, we will know who is then going to act. Uh, we knew previously, we were informed that we have an acting DG, but the DG came back. So we don't know. Uh, we know he has taken through the media, of course, but we would like to know about who is going to act now. So it's something that, as the portfolio committee, we deserve to know. Um, as much as the agenda has not yet been flighted, I may touch on the apologies. We have a standing apology from Ms. Martinise, who is our committee secretary, as she is part uh, of the support for the actual committee for floods that are pent in Eastern Cape and KZN. So she is part of that, and as such, today they are meeting with the general. We also received a, a apology from the minister uh, um, indicating that uh, she will also not be part of this meeting today. We also have an apology from, we have an apology from Honorable Jobo, who is on the flight uh, right now as we speak to Cape Town. Uh, once uh, she lands in Cape Town, she will uh, join the meeting. And she indicated that that will be around half past 10. So we only have those apologies. Any other apologies? Can you please flight the, um, the agenda, please? Uh, another apology, honorable members, do we have any other apology other than the ones that I've mentioned? Uh, Chair, yes. I sent through the WhatsApp, I have forgotten that to, to forward uh, yesterday. I have some submissions to make. I'm writing uh, an exam. So if I can be excused at half past 10, I'm, I'm, I'm left behind. OK, I think you, we always appreciate that our honorable members will try to improve their education by studying. We appreciate what you are doing, uh, honorable Shabalala. Um, we will then allow you to leave the meeting at half past 10. Um, can you please flight the agenda? Uh... Um, unfortunately, Chair, I do not have um, a copy of the agenda, but what I can do is um, make Sita okay. Bisa um, is the co-host, so she's able to flight it, then she can do so. Okay, no problems. We will then invite the department um through dm to present on a dm over to you uh, thank you thank you honorable chairperson a good morning to you to you and the honorable members of the committee um to the support team uh, of parliament together with the support team from um, the, the department. Uh, and in this case, they are led by the responsible uh, DDG, uh, DDG CJ Abrams, um, who will be leading uh, the, uh, the presentation. Um, but understanding, Chair, uh, from your comments that uh, we are ending the, the Women's Month, but also um, tomorrow we will be. Honorable Shabalala, please, please mute. Honorable Shabalala. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, 
being uh, spring day tomorrow, I, I think uh, in Cape Town, it's, it's starting today. Uh, the weather is quite beautiful outside. Um, but Chair, allow me to first um, appreciate the fact that uh, the committee has seen it fit to call us to account, especially on the question of uh, data use management uh, by the by the responsible directorate, um, which is the EPWP um, program. Um, because with uh, data, the, the, the decision making uh, becomes um, faster. Uh, it also becomes reliable uh, as well as uh, it builds confidence because it's a good base on which you strategize. And, and therefore, I do want to appreci appreciate upfront uh, this uh, opportunity that is given to the department and afforded to the people of South Africa to understand uh, deeper uh, through our report on, on our data management on EPWP, the, 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 the workings of that uh, uh, division or directorate as well as the, 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 the strategy uh, moving forward, the kind of responses uh, that we are um, making, informed by the data, of course, um, understanding also that um, in as much as uh, in that report, you will see that we are doing quite well um, in, in the social sector, uh, where areas of home-based care, early childhood development, those issues or those areas that feed into social cohesion. And, and, um, and therefore, this program is a, not just a program, um, it, not just a, a poverty relief program, but it also contributes uh, to the development of the, of the people of the country. Uh, in a manner that um, builds and strengthens um, families um, and therefore uh, contributes a great deal uh, to building our communities. Uh, that being said, uh, Honorable Chair, um, without me going too far, let me allow um, DDG uh, CJ Abrams who will be leading the presentation. But once more, let me appreciate uh, the, the, the approach uh, of the department, thank, of the portfolio committee. Thank you, Chair. Over to you, CJ, uh, through, through you, Chairperson. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Deputy Minister. And um, good morning, uh, Chair. Let me just see on my camera. Uh, thank you and good morning to all the members and all the uh, support in relation to the Portfolio Committee and then the EPWP uh, staff members that have joined us here today. In terms of the presentation, um, we would be looking through the Department of Public Works coordination role, uh, the role that is required by other departments, uh, looking at the funding um, provided to other public bodies as per uh, the uh, allocation processes within our country, uh, the EPWP reporting system, measures to uh, undertaken to obtain a clean audit and also how audits will be managed and handled with regard to other public bodies. In terms of the brief that we have received, um, we were requested to uh, brief the Portfolio Committee on progress in terms of improving the management of employment data. And so therefore, we would be looking at those processes, particularly focusing on what we have done in this last uh, period to obtain uh, and progressively move to a clean audit. Uh, and look at some of our ICT and some innovation strategies that are being undertaken 
by us as the coordinating department. And then also then looking at the reporting components of departments and provinces and municipalities uh, so that there can be some form of standardization and with the aim of strengthening compliance. And for us, it was critical to look then at the role of DPWI, and that will be an intensive component of this presentation, particularly from a budget and an accountability perspective. We have taken a step back to be able to then articulate uh, the role of public works, which is then uh, as per the EPWP mandate, uh, and as per endorsed by cabinet uh, and as per on our website, um, which is then uh, put out in the EPWP uh, business plan, which governs the EPWP phase four, uh, the role of public works. And the role of public works is to provide a coordinating, a supportive environment, enabling environment for the implementation, provide guidance and support to public bodies, that are required to implement the EPWP. We are also the transfer officer for the EPWP incentive grant. In terms of our vote, we receive 1.6 billion. We also then are responsible for putting out uh, various policies for the management of training and enterprise development, relying then on public bodies also to be able to fund that aspect. We then provide a monitoring and evaluation reporting support uh, we've got to help this, for example, uh, we have to maintain the EPWP reporting system. Um, and so we've developed what we then have as a, a web-based system, which is the EPWP reporting system. And we also provide and put out then our annexures, which we then have on our DPWI EPWP website, which puts out the performance of the program as far back as 2004 on a quarterly basis um, uh, in terms of the data that is reported by public bodies into the EPWP reporting system. We also provide training to officials implementing the EPWP. And uh, last week, we managed to train a further uh, EPWP officials um, or people undertaking EPWP projects. They're not EPWP officials. They are officials um, implementing various EPWP projects across all spheres. And uh, we managed to roll out then again our learning program. And also we uh, roll out extensive training to public bodies to ensure that they know how to report utilizing the EPWP reporting system. We also undertake data validation and cleaning uh, of the data that is reported by public bodies. In terms of public works as a transferring officer, to note that we do get audited uh, in relation to our role as a transferring officer. And we do receive clean audit in relation to the transfer of this funds. Uh, in terms of 22-23, we have 1.6 billion as mentioned, and uh, the breakdown is provided as per the grants, which is the integrated grant for municipalities, the integrated grant for provinces, and the EPWP social sector incentive grant for provinces. It's important to note that that expenditure equals about 8% of all expenditure on the EPWP. And the subsequent slides will then advise on where other allocations are in relation to other organizations' votes uh, for the EPWP. DPWI also receives the allocation for the NPO program. This is earmarked funding specific for the IDT and specific for the rollout of the NPO program for which the IDT will be accountable in relation to the program implementation. In terms of the EPWP design, it recognizes that um, public bodies have to use their equitable share and their conditional grants to implement the EPWP mainly recognizing the principle of leveraging EPWP funds. And in total, there are about 358 public bodies that are all assigned EPWP work opportunity targets. The process of assigning is an engagement undertaken with the public bodies. 
considering the budgets of the various public bodies for various types of um, 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 services that government does provide, goods and services, and then basing on previous performance also, having a look at putting out certain targets for public bodies. And the table provides us then with an indication of the targets that you then have. So in the Eastern Cape, there are 39 municipalities. Each of them then have specific targets, uh, either in the infrastructure, social or environment sector. And the same then with the free state, GP, all the provinces. And so all public bodies are expected to participate in the EPWP. In total, there are 87 uh, provincial departments that have a target and 19 national departments. This information is all disaggregated and disaggregated per sector, per year, um, and then per public body. Um, in terms of this, as mentioned, this is just a summary table. Now, a critical component that happened in 2021 was we met with the Auditor General in May. And in May, we met with the Auditor General and the Department of uh, Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation to look at how we could move to a clean audit. And that clear engagement with our executive authority, uh, sorry, not with our accounting authority, was um, the direction that we got and the advice we received was that our MTSF needs to reflect that the various spheres of government are responsible for the EPWP. Prior to the revised medium-term strategic framework, it was only public works uh, that was then articulated in the MTSF. And therefore, the revision allowed for public bodies to account because DPME advised that if the budgets are allocated to these public bodies, public bodies need to be held accountable in accordance with the flow of funds. Now, in terms of the implementing bodies, the responsibility, and it, those are the 358 organizations mentioned in the table above listed, they are responsible to use their own funds which is the equitable share and conditional grants, which is inclusive of the incentive grants for the implementation of the projects. As mentioned, the EPWP incentive grant as a whole is only 8% of the EPWP expenditure, and therefore much of the leveraging would be required on other funds, such as MIG, for example. Public bodies need to design and implement EPWP programs in line with the EPWP serial change. They need to report accurate data, and this is a requirement as per the ministerial determination for EPWP. They have to report accurate data on our EPWP reporting system. They need to also then retain the data, and that is the section 12 of the ministerial determination that says all data must be retained by the organization implementing the project. They need to monitor the quality of the program in terms of the assets and the service delivered. They also need to be able to um, uh, ensure that, um, that obviously data management principles are adhered to. And the data collected on the EPWP reporting system is then that DPWI utilizes for putting out the quarterly performance data. Um, for us, it was then critical, and I think throughout the years, we've, we've never gone to unpack what are the sources of funding in EPWP. As mentioned, it is a funding that public bodies have to be able to leverage. Now, in terms of the Division of Revenue Act, you then have um, the MIG, and the MIG has then $17.6 billion. In the terms of the targets that have been assigned to public bodies, it is assumed that 30% of the MIG would be utilized for the creation of EPWP work opportunities. In the Division of Revenue Act, there are specific conditionalities, particularly related to the EPWP, that would then advise uh, on how that would then happen. 
In terms of the community work program, it is an EPWP program. It is in the non-state sector and the allocation is 4.4 billion in 23-24. And the target then in the business plan of the EPWP is 252,000 work opportunities. Vote 32 from the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment is for environmental programs and an annual allocation is also made. 3.9 billion is then allocated for 23-24. And the focus there is to look at infrastructure related projects that contribute to environmental protection, conservation, sustainability, whilst also creating work opportunities and other programs relate to water resource management, biological diversity, and the functioning of natural systems. There are other smaller grants uh, in terms of the mineral resources and energy vote, for which there are also conditions in the Division of Revenue Act. Similarly, for the Urban Integrated Urban Development Grant that is given to COPTA, there's also conditionalities for the EPWP there. Then vote 38, Department of Tourism under the Destination Development Branch, you would, there would also be an allocation for the EPWP and also the Department of Social Development under the Specials Projects and Innovation Branch. Then a large part of the EPWP work opportunities um, has uh, funding through the Provincial Maintenance Grant and that is then put on the vote of the Department of Transport, and it's about 13 billion for 23-24. And here it is assumed that 25% of the Provincial Roads Maintenance Grant is used to create EPWP opportunities. The assumptions then look at what is feasible in relation to the types of projects undertaken. And therefore, we know that the grant is meant to undertake other aspects, but the part that is suitable for EPWP work would therefore then be the 25% assumption. And then other public bodies are all required to use the equitable share. In terms of the EPWP reporting system, it is a web-based system and it's an online reporting system. And so it is digital. And for DPWI, we only put out information in the annexures that have been validated. And so if the process does not uh, uh, meet the validation requirements, uh, it then remains in the, pub in the system for the public bodies to correct. And uh, corrected data then will be published in subsequent quarter quarters. As the department, we are always um, improving on our EPWP reporting system. Now, um, this uh, late last financial year, we've managed to migrate all the public bodies at a national sphere and a provincial sphere to our new um, EPWP reporting system that has a biometric feature. The biometric feature is based on facial recognition and also a date stamp verification of participants that are on site. This then will assist with the collection of data and will eliminate the need for attendance registers uh, where the biometric system is utilized by the public body. And uh, we then um, will be piloting this after we've managed to migrate all public bodies. So as mentioned, national departments have been piloted, uh, provincial departments have been piloted, when we do that in a phased manner, it is in, in order to ensure that the system can handle the number of users. And so even before we brought any users onto the system, we did stress testing, um, as is a ICT norm. And uh, we now have to then strengthen our system to ensure that the system doesn't slow down once we uh, bring the municipalities into the system. Then uh, another important component for us is to link the EPWP reporting system to the National Population Register of the Department of Home Affairs, which we have done already, and we have to check uh, participant ID data and associated data. We are also now working with the Department of Employment um, and uh, Labor on the Work Seeker database, the ESA system, which is the Employment Services of South Africa system.
It is a system in terms of vacancies in the broader economy, and it is a work data seeker, um, work seeker database. And so therefore it is aimed at ensuring that the opportunities and the job seekers then match. And for us, it's critical that we then create the linkage so that particularly with the EPWP exited uh, workers, that their work experience in the EPWP can then be transferred to their profile on ESA. And when work opportunities become available within the broader economy, that um, uh, EPWP participants can uh, um, have the opportunity to be able to compete for those particular positions. Another initiative that we are now promoting with the public bodies, and we've got what we call a data quality forum, we will continue to engage with public bodies to adopt what we call a standardized templates for attendance registers, payment registers, employment contracts. And through doing that, it will allow a public body um, to be able to undertake electronic checks in terms of the data that they uh, may choose to load on our EPWP reporting system. In terms of public works efforts to undertake a clean audit, and I've, I've gone through some of this already. So we are cognizant of the fact that the department uh, has had um, adverse findings. And there's been several interventions over the last few years uh, in an attempt to ensure we obtain a clean audit. Um, and so it has been that um, the reporting of participants tested as valid based on uploaded uh, documentation, okay, was one initiative undertaken. But from an auditing perspective, if one does that, it could lead then to under-reporting. So even though the reported and the source of the information is improved, the challenge would be under-reporting. And that would also then lead to a finding. DPWI went on an extensive in, um, uh, intervention and consulting with public bodies to develop what we call an audit uh, standard operating procedure based on the guidance from the Auditor General. Um, and it therefore then informs public bodies on the important requirements when reporting on the implementation of EPWP and to guide them on how to perform audits or verification of their own data. We also went ahead and we introduced what we call a customized indicator for DPWI provincial coordinating departments, and we developed a practice note. And we ultimately still continue to have the finding. And so as mentioned in 21-22, we thought it best to sit down with the Auditor General and the DPME and really ask the question, how do we address this matter? It was important for us to have both the departments, both organizations um, engaging so that we could collectively try to understand how to address this matter. And the key component was then a continued uh, inclusion and then obviously the revision of the customized indicator for the period for the DPWI provincial coordinating departments. And then to change the MTSF, the medium term strategic framework indicator which was previously uh, said to be number of work opportunities reported through public uh, other public employment programs to actually change it to the number of validated EPWP work opportunities reported by public bodies into the reporting system. And then indicating that all spheres of government as what the EPWP has put out since phase two, we've put out targets per public body since phase two, uh, is now then reflective of exactly how the program is functioning. And that will then mean that lead and contributing departments um, will also be responsible uh, and are required to be able to contribute uh, to that particular target and has therefore audit implications. And therefore also public works as per the advice received from the Auditor General. We received a letter from the Auditor General on the 8th of July that clearly indicated that DPWI will have to look at its coordination function and any aspect that they are responsible for in terms of the EPWP and uh, amend its APP. 
and uh, we've gone ahead and we have done that. We will be engaging with the Auditor General further to ensure that whatever the advice we've received is then fully implemented. But from the department side, we have done as what was put out uh, in that letter of 8th of July. If you proceed. Now, in terms of other public bodies, and this is the last slide, and given the change in the MTSF, is that EPWP projects should be audited by the Auditor General at the reporting public bodies, and the responsible accounting officers should be held accountable for audit findings on non-compliance to the EPWP guidelines. DPME advised that public bodies should include APP indicators for which public bodies have direct responsibility. And DPME further advised that public bodies should be accountable for allocated budgets and resources. And that Chapter 5 of the PFMA provides for the responsibilities of accounting officers. Uh, Deputy Minister and Chair and members, thank you very much. Any thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, CJ. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, in your opening uh, remarks, you you posed a question on uh, the leadership of the department administratively. Um, I I need to confirm that yes, um, did. DG Vugela, it's his last day today at work. And um, from tomorrow, he's on retirement. Um, but as to who will act, <laughs> it's, it's a difficult one for me now. Uh, remember that um, it, it, that is the responsibility of the of the minister uh, in consultation with the, with the presidency, um, given that now um, the, the issue of the DG has, has been resolved. And I'm almost certain that um, one of the reasons why minister wouldn't be here would be that she is attending to some of those uh, issues. And uh, I'm sure by end of today, we shall know who will be acting. Um, I, I thought I missed to, to respond to that earlier. I, and I felt I wouldn't want to create an impression that we, we, we don't want to answer. <laughs> we, we, they, it, it's, it's just that um, the procedures are as such. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, we will await. Uh, comments uh, from the members and questions. Well, thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, GM. Um, honorable members, um, the presentation has been made to us. I now invite you to comment, um, ask questions on the presentation made. Um, um, according to the hands that have been raised, uh, it will be Honorable Higlin, followed by Honorable Graham Mare, followed by Honorable Tring, followed by Honorable Suiza. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I had hoped that uh, Minister Delil would be in, so I have addressed my my thoughts to her. Um, Honourable Kivet, if you will, if you will uh, take it on her behalf, I have approached my thinking slightly differently, um, and if you'll just indulge what I'm going to say, I think the biggest problem that I have with this presentation, although I thank you for it is that we are approaching it as an exercise in a numbers game as opposed to and 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 the title is how to obtain a clean audit as opposed to how do we change the lives of people 
who desperately need their lives changed by giving them access to a job. And that is how I have approached my discussions on the EPWP. Since 2019, the DPWI has been saying the same thing, that the EPWP is the saving grace of the jobless in South Africa, but actually it isn't. Um, because, and I'm asking the minister, in this case, the deputy minister, as the executive authority, to please consider what I'm going to say to you and what I'm going to put on the table. The EPWP in this particular financial year, 2022-23, has a budget of 1.6 billion rand. Its basic premise should be skills transfer and the upliftment of the poorest of the poor, especially the youth, women, and persons with disabilities, as well as the true meaningful way to create worthwhile job opportunities. EPWP can no longer be a farfi game that we used to play in the townships in the old days. It must be a meaningful way to create sustainable development goals that change people's lives. Sadly, what we see is that the EPWP has merely become a numbers exercise, a way to spend budgets and create work opportunities in terms of meeting targets. Let me elaborate. On slide six, we are shown that e we are shown the EPWP targets that have not been met since 2009. In 2018-2019 financial year, the target of 6 million work opportunities um, in the infrastructure sector and the non-state community works programs were the highest at 56.5% and 62.1% respectively. Infrastructure reported 1.4 million work opportunities against a target of 2.4 million work opportunities in the five-year target. The non-state sector community works program reported 912,412 work opportunities against a five-year work target of 1.4 million work opportunities. The environment and cultural sector reported 819 1,497 work opportunities against a five-year target of 1.2 million. The social sector reported 828,277 work opportunities against a five-year target of 1 million work opportunities. Overall, phase three achieved 4.52 million work opportunities against a 6 million work opportunity target. And instead of increasing monitoring and evaluation to elevate the EPWPs to meet the targets, what has DPWI done? They've lowered the targets. They haven't increased monitoring and evaluation to increase the number of meaningful job opportunities that have been created. They've lowered the target to 5 million. So what we're actually doing is playing farfi. We're playing a numbers game with jobs. We're playing a numbers game with targets instead of increasing the way in which we create meaningful job creation opportunities. It's become a neighbor numbers game, not a job creation scheme. And that's what worries me. The DPWI and Minister DeLille, in this case, Deputy Minister Kivit, you are the executive authority within the DPWI. You have it within your power to sit down with the Department of Higher Education and create a platform of certification to develop a program that ensures that the people who enter the EPWP become capacitated. They become empowered appropriately. 
that they get a platform to develop proper skills for development, for genuine upliftment of the poorest of the poor and the most vulnerable. When I was in my constituency recently, I met with a lot of people who had had job opportunity, work opportunities given to them through the EPWP program. They have moved within the EPWP environment for the last seven or eight years, whether it's been working as a potato peeler or a, a street sweeper or a trench digger. None of them wanted to actually be a potato peeler or a trench digger, but those were the opportunities that were available to them. They went from one potato peeler to an onion peeler to a street sweeper to a trench digger. There was no upskilling. There was no development of their skills in what they really wanted to do. There was no certification at the end of that six month period, but it was a job opportunity, a work opportunity. At the end of that six month opportunity, they got no piece of paper that said, I am a qualified potato peeler, or I am a qualified onion chopper or street sweeper. And so they never progressed. What would have been so much better for those people was if there had been an opportunity for them to be upskilled, for them to have been trained in something that would have qualified them, that at the end of that six month period, they would have got a certificate that said they had qualified in X, X program that they had sat an exam for that would have enabled them to progress to the next level, which is why I'm saying the DPWI and the Department of Higher Education needs to set a curriculum for people who are part of the EPWP program to be elevated to the next level so that when they get another opportunity within the EPWP, they progress so that the person who this time is a potato peeler in six months time goes on to do a basic course in business skills so that in two years time, he has the ability to know how to peel potatoes. He then has some kind of job skilling so that he has a, an idea of business acumen because maybe he wants to open a restaurant. Maybe he doesn't just want to open, uh, peel potatoes and chop onions. Maybe he wants to become a restaurateur and he has some business skills behind him that enables him to go beyond and he has his entrepreneurial skills uplifted because that's what we want to do. We want to give him a couple of stepping stones that this stepping stone leads to that stepping stone so that ultimately he doesn't, we are only enabling him one step beyond being a beggar. We are not giving him an opportunity to grow his skills enough to get out of being beggars, to not have to depend on the 350 Rand um, SRD grant or the EPWP menial job status. And it's within the power of the DPWI to take hands with the, the Department of Higher Education to upskill him or her to get out of this slump, to create an environment where that person becomes better skilled, has a job transfer opportunity to learn more, to get business skills, to become an entrepreneur, get out of the cycle of poverty. It's within this department's purview. It's within this department's purview to get a policy working group together with the Department of Higher Education 
and really make meaningful change for sustainable development to get people out of poverty. It's I, I've just approached the EPWP from a completely different point of view because that's what I think we need. I think South Africa needs solutions that are out of the box. And I really and truly am appealing to you. I'm appealing to the DPWI that what we need is out of the box thinking to change the way we view the EPWP, not from the perspective of we need a clean audit, but we need a way to take people out of poverty with meaningful job creation. And I've used the EPWP because that's the best way the DPWI has to do that. And please, I'm begging you, think about what I've said. Thank you so much. I will leave it there. Thank you, Honorable Higlin. Honorable Graham, Mary. Good morning, everybody, um, and to CJ, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it's nice to see that there has been pro uh, progression made in the department because I know how hard you have been working on trying to, to get um, some level of um, sort of um, assistance from the other departments that utilize the, the, D, the EPWP system um, because I know that the issue actually isn't within DPWI but within um, the bodies that are making use of the program. Um, I just got a couple of questions um, that I'd like to, to get clarified, please. So the first one is, in terms of the EPWP um, reporting system, uh, you did say that there are people using it and it is being um, it is being verified, but what is the extent of the usage of the system? In other words, is has it become mandatory that every single person or every single body that receives a grant or grant funding must make use of the EPWP um, system? And if not, is there a way that we can um, enforce that? So that would be, and you, you know, we've spoken in the past about withholding funding, um, and the problem with that, obviously, is that the beneficiaries are the people that suffer and not the people that are not doing their jobs. So have we found another way to enforce compliance on the part of the body that is responsible for the reporting? Um, and, I, and I think the idea around um, having them carry the responsibility of an Auditor General's outcome as the reporting body is 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 one way of in, ensuring that that happens because then obviously it, it then affects their own outcomes, um, and while I agree with with uh, my colleague on the fact that that this should should be a more meaningful um, program, at the end of the day, um, this department needs to to obviously focus on audit outcomes to make sure that a we continue to get the funding we need to support our programs so that we can make a meaningful difference. Um, and then what I wanted to find out is what is the threshold of for the admin costs uh, for a, a, a body that is implementing an EPWP program? So in other words, uh, you, you know, it must all the funding go to the, the beneficiaries uh, um, in terms of the stipend that they receive, or is the body allowed to take a portion of the allocated funding and use that to manage and run and administrate the EPWP programs? On page, uh, on slide six, where we speak about the other bodies, uh, I think I will probably be putting in questions around what the funds are specifically used for so that we have an idea. What I would like to know is whether or not we then, I, I submit those questions to the ministers of the various um, departments or whether or not I submit via DPWI to get an idea of where the funds are being used in each of those departments. Again, on the MIG and on the road uh, projects, 30% uh, on the MIG, 25% on the road projects. What I wanted to know is the 30% of that fund, is that for the whole project or just for the payment of the participants? Again, the question being whether or not um, they pay. So if it's, if it's a road clearing project and they're using EPWP participants, is the 25% for the beneficiary payments or is the 25% inclusive of um, overalls, equipment, mowers, weed eaters, etc. Um, because I think it's important to know whether or not there is a percentage allocation that cannot be exceeded for support of the system versus the payment of the beneficiaries. Um, and an example of that is CWP. CWP is 
if it was being properly implemented in municipalities, would be an outstanding program. Because the idea behind CWP was that it was a step out of poverty. It was a limited duration project. So people couldn't stay on it for years and years and years because the idea would be that there would be some element of upliftment or skills transfer or skills training that would emanate from that program. So in our municipality, we had um, people did welding, um, people learned how to do community gardens, people learned how to do composting. Um, we, we set up... Um, a, a basket weaving thing um, where they were doing arts and crafts and making cushions, et cetera, that they could sell. The idea then being that we give them the skills, we give them the support, and ultimately they step out of CWP and become entrepreneurs or, or have skills where they can be employed. Now, that whole program was then there was an implementing agent that was responsible for that, and they obviously got money out of it. Um, again, one of the, the things that we were trying to get going or that I was trying to get going in our municipality was to utilize something like CWP for barefoot plumbers so that we could train we could train people to be plumbers and then the municipality could utilize them for repairs that fell um, within the yard of, of somebody which is not under the, the auspices of the municipality, but sometimes people are too poor to fix their own plumbing so the leaks get exacerbated because they can't be repaired. So those were the sort of ideas that we were using CWP for um, because it creates an entire sort of ecosystem of work and, and um, opportunities. That seems to have stopped. CWP has become a street sweeping, pick up rubbish program. Um, how can we make that, that return that to what it was originally done? And, and what was the percentage then in terms of funding of what was used in, in, in the skills transfer, et cetera? versus the, the number of beneficiaries that they could support. Um, then just in terms of the of slide seven, um, the slide mentions the above mentioned verification process, but I, I didn't see anything that really spoke to what that verification process was. But I do like the idea of the biometric approach because I think it's almost, it's, it's, it's quite sort of fail safe. The only problem is, is where, for example, I live in a rural municipality, there's not always signal to be um, uploading information. Um, your supervisors who would be responsible for making use of the biometrics often don't have money for data. So we would need to get around how, how that biometric system could work in those rural areas. But I do believe that that's the way to go. I think paper-based is easily forged. The verification is, is an issue. Um, I know even during lockdown, we had supervisors going to visit people at their houses, getting them to sign, and those people had never shown up for work for a day. So we need to, we need to find those sort of fail-safes, but we have to understand that there will be issues in rural areas. Um, and then I, I really appreciate the standardization concept. I think it's an excellent way of doing it and it will make your ability to enforce compliance so much easier. So um, I think it's I think we are definitely, I mean, there's been a massive progression in my in my eyes from, from when we started in 2019 to where we are at now. And hats off to you, CJ, and your team for, for the work that you have done already. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Graham Murray. Honorable Trink, uh, I've also seen uh, Honorable Marcelle and Honorable Franz Kalvik. You will follow uh, Honorable Suiza. Honorable Trink. Um, thank you, Chair. Chair, the, the ACDP welcomes the, the presentation, and um, the presentation itself, I think, outlines the attempt. Uh, to get the recipients um, of the disbursements to our sister departments in terms of um, EPWP funds to become compliant and, and hence ensuring that the department uh, does not attain another failed audit, uh, I think which has been a, a thorn in the flesh in the department over the last few years. Um, but my my just essentially three three questions. We also support, I think I support the comments made by my uh, previous colleagues with regards to just um, the progression from from having a, a EPW job to to skills transfer and, and skills development and I think that has to be a part of of the EPWP program but maybe just three simple questions um, CJ if you could also just please expand on the the criteria uh, that the, uh, the the different departments sister departments would would need uh to that they would need to adhere to uh for the the new digital 
uh, reporting system to become viable and, and effective. So what is that, what is that set of criteria uh, that, that they would need? And then secondly, with our municipalities being in, in so much trouble, um, as indicated by the Auditor General, some 40 to 50% of our municipalities, many of them, um, no longer going concerns. Will these municipalities have the capacity uh, to comply um, with, with the, the new system? Um, and if they don't, what other measures besides withholding funds um, uh, will be put in place to ensure that they become compliant? And then my, my last question is, you, you spoke about um, just moving in a, in a phased position with regards to the reporting system to ensure that uh, it, is, it has a capacity to, uh, to contain, the capacity to, uh, to produce so that there's no kind of overloading of the, of the system. I know that within your financial sectors, uh, my son works in, in, in the IT, IT sector for one of the big banks, um, and they have kind of parallel systems. And I don't know whether there's the finance for that. So that you, if, if you have one system that crashes, um, you quickly then revert to to the se second system. So you're doing it in a phased a phased approach, so that you don't have a, a a crash and the system doesn't become overloaded. But is there kind of a backup um, that you have should the system become overloaded and 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 crash? Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Tring, Honorable Suisa. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Chair, I'm going to go straight. It, it's very worrying when you look at, at, at the presentation and then you look at the splendid job that is done by the researchers of, of that we are working with in, 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 in the committee. And you, you find so much information from them, which you are expecting that the department should be the ones who are providing us with all of this information. It's, it's worrying that when you go to the notes, you find that from phase three to phase four, only 5% of women, uh, it, it's an increase of 5%, despite the fact that majority of citizens in South Africa are women, and then you only find that it has moved with, with, 5%, with 5%. Unemployment rate has gone so up, in, in especially when we went into the COVID and everything, and yet we still find the young people not having or being given the opportunity to be part of the EPWP. And I think that not enough is also done to, to roll in people with disability. It's, it's, it's of a great concern. I will go to the NPOs and NGOs because I believe that all of these departments, and I think, Chair, because EPWP is, is a program, is a baby of, the, of public works, and there are all of these departments that are also using EPWP to do some of the work. Maybe in future, these departments must be part of, or they must be invited to a meeting to come and explain to us, to say, how, how does their EPWP work? Because we, we find that, my worry is that most of the beneficiaries are being exploited, especially by NPOs and NGOs. Because if the Department of Roads is going to implement EP, is going to take EPWP beneficiaries to, to do roads and everything. Oh, uh, you'd find that the NPO or whoever is being given the tender to do that is exploiting. These people go home with nothing in hand. They basically work for bread on the table. There's nothing that they can point to say, I was in the EPWP program. This is what I have benefited from them. This is, I can show you, I've bought myself a stove or a bed, or I managed to build a proper shed. That's one of the, the issues that I have. I want to go to the, this program of work seeker program that the presenter was talking about to say that They've got a program, they are in, in collaboration with the Department of Labor and Employment, whereby they've got this program. 
Are the people out there aware that there's such a program? How does the program work? Does it mean I have to put in my own details and then they are captured on their system? If there's employment available anywhere, especially the EPWP beneficiaries, which I don't know which skills are they getting because most of them, they're sweeping streets and cleaning graveyards. If there's any employment that comes out, are these beneficiaries, if they are on the system, are they going to be contacted to say, here is a permanent, there's permanent employment at this place, please go there. Are they going to be as absorbed or does it mean they have to go through the whole process of selection and interviews and all of those things for them to be employed? If they can just elaborate on that program. Um, can we get, I thought that we'll get a comparison past years, 2022-23, and then because the slides mostly speak about 23-24 financial year as to what's going to happen. And if we could have gotten a, a, a clear idea as to what's happening 22, 23, then we can have a better idea as to how the money is actually spent. And the other one is the breakdown or the allocation that they are talking about for the financial year of 2023-24. And the money that is given to all of these public bodies. How is the, what are the amounts that are given to each and every province? And what is the priority? I think I've once asked this question. I'm not sure if I ever received the response to that. As to what is the criteria to tell us that Eastern Cape gets 20 rents, KZN gets 10 rents, Houghton gets 50 rents, Cape the Western Cape gets 100 rents. What are the criteria that they are using to say this province gets so much money? Because in the rural areas, the high employment rate is very high. One, due to the lack of education, or the lack of funding to go and study further, or the lack of because people are being held up by traditions to say a girl child can go to school, they are going to get married, so there's no need for us to take them to school. Some of them don't go to school because the parents do not have money. Some do not go to school because the school is too far for them to be actually educated in the rural areas. So how is the allocation done in the provinces? What criteria is used for the allocation of, of these funds into provinces? And then I would go to the issue of the Department of Transport and they talk about provincial roads and nothing is being said by the local roads that fall under the municipalities. What is being done? Is it also part, does it mean that provincial is going to give local and then local sorts out the local roads and what are the allocations also there? Because I, I thought that the report will be in detail that we can, but unfortunately for us, some of these issues, we could find them in the information that we got, got from the researchers and also from us when we go around and see what happens out there. And my greatest concern again, Chair, is the exploitation of EPWP beneficiaries. They do most of the work, but the people that have been given to administer and make sure that this work is done, they walk away with a lot of money. They enrich themselves and exploit these people because of they are being told that at least we are giving you something. It's not like when we are sitting at home and we need to move away from that. And I think the only best thing that needs to happen is that these beneficiaries, because we are forever going to need people who sweep the streets. We are forever going to need people who clean the graveyards. There's always going to be graveyards, new graveyards. that are, So there's forever going to be employment. Why can't these people the beneficiaries of EPWP 
easily be absorbed into the system and insourcing happens so that they can get permanent employment with benefits because at this moment they don't have any benefits. What you get is what you go home with and it's the end of the story. And also the period of employment to say six months. I also, I think in the past, I've also raised that, that in six months, you can't even open an installment to say, I want to buy my kids a TV or something. So why can't they extend the period to at least one year, one year, six months, or two years for people to be able to benefit properly from the program and avoid this exploitation? And what criteria are they monitoring these NPOs? Are these NPOs held accountable if they do not deliver? What interventions are put in place by the Department of Public Works, knowing that the PWP is their baby? If NPOs do not deliver on what they are supposed to deliver on, what intervention is done against those NPOs and NGOs? Or if a public body does not deliver on the mandate, what intervention is done by, by the department itself? Uh, and that's only that for now. Um, Chair, if there's anything that comes up, I'll come back for another bite. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Suisa. Honorable Marcella. <coughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Greetings to yourself and uh, fellow members. The Deputy Minister and your interrogate, uh, including the support staff of the Portfolio Committee. Morning. Chair, few questions which probably one might want uh, clarity on. Firstly, we I want to welcome the presentation. I hope probably now that we are trying to introduce the system, we are moving towards the, the right direction. And I understand that the system with a living uh, institution, it will be corrected as, a, as we move. Chair, what, uh, what is the plan of the department in probably skilling these participants such that uh, uh, at the exit end, they can utilize the skill, they can utilize what uh, they've gained here whether both in public and, and in the private sector, particularly in the private sector. If, for instance, we have got people cleaning here and we, in this intervening period, they are cleaning a particular building, um, what is the future plan of uh, making sure that those people are, are being absorbed there? That share takes me to also saying, do, do the department, does the department have a, a plan to prevent uh, participants uh, from being exploited by institutions. <laughs> More often than not, you 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 will ask yourself a question to say if probably this EPWP people were not there, who was going to clean this cemetery? Who was going to do all these odd jobs that they are doing? Because I I, I think uh, at the same time we. We must not create a situation where our people are being exploited instead of them getting proper jobs in that particular space. So one, one has an interest in checking if we do have a plan to avoid exploitation of our people. The, the last comment share, uh, probably the last question share would be, what will the department do? And uh, this question, was asked equally by Honorable Trim. What will uh, you do in the event that institutions do not comply uh, in line with your, your system? Uh, I'm raising this chair because a simple thing that could be done would be to say, if this particular department or municipality is not complying, we, we stop funding. And Therefore, beneficiaries are going to suffer simply because Tim Marshall somewhere did not do his job. And the, 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 the people who are going to suffer they are the needy ones. It's not the one who have failed to perform his functions. Now, does the department have a plan 
to go around and implement itself in the event where an institution is failing? What, what, what plan do we have outside the stopping the funding? Because if you stop the funding, you're only punishing the institution. You're not punishing the institution, you're punishing the people on the ground. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Marcelle, Honorable Franz Calvey. Thank you, Chairperson, and good morning to the Honorable Chairperson, our Deputy Minister, our members, as well as the staff members, including the departmental officials. Thank you very much, Chairperson, for this opportunity. And also, I'm, I'm welcoming the presentation that has been made. And we've engaged on, on the same issues over the past few years. And we, we, we are still finding ourselves with uh, the same challenges in this regard. So I'm not going to mention the issues that has been raised previously, although I'm, I'm fully concurring with, with the, uh, the challenges that has been raised or the concerns that has been raised by some of my colleagues that sp uh, spoke before me. So Chairperson, uh, to me, I'm still of the opinion that uh, this is an excellent uh, pr program, an excellent flagship program, as it has been recognized internationally. But I'm, I'm just afraid, Chairperson, that we, we might uh, be losing out in terms of uh, bettering this, the, the, the system and in terms of addressing the challenges that have been raised over the past few years. So I'm, I'm really encouraged by the, uh, the collaborative efforts with the Department of Employment and Labor in terms of the ISA program, and I think it's an excellent initiative. My uh, uh, challenge would just be then, Chairperson, that uh, when we look at the skills that that the those exiting the participants, those that who are exiting the program, the skills that they are obtaining, it's it's not really skills that. Uh, would, would, would advance them in terms of further employment opportunities. So as been raised in the previous years, uh, on a continuous basis, I'm still of the view that this program should focus more on skills transfers, skills which uh, will be needed in the job market in such a way that you look at the skills that uh, is needed in, in, especially in the private sector, seeing that we have this challenge of, of high unemployment and government is not in a position to, to, uh, to, to employ all these unemployed people, but we need to, to get a, a private sector on board. But it won't help if we are developing uh, these participants and we have a skills mismatch. The skills that they are acquiring is not actually needed in the job market in the private sector. So if we can improve on that issue, it will really uh, benefit our people and, and, and assist us. But Chairperson, it has been raised in the past also that uh, the program is struggling to attract and retain youths uh, in, 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 in this regard. Maybe it's because of, 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 of the type of, of skills that are offering, are uh, being offered, like, like uh, uh, Honorable Suisa said, they are glorified sweepers and working in cemeteries. So, so maybe if we can look at, at, at the type of skills like in the uh, tourism industry and many industries that, that that's now flaring up, which needs uh, uh, skills. If we can look at, at uh, attracting our youth uh, through uh, um, uh, assisting them with those kind of thing, uh, skills, it would also assist. We are, are seeing chairperson uh, we are in the era of uh, within the high unemployment rate that our 
citizens are becoming so impatient and it's rightfully so. And we would see that uh, we have uh, foreigners that, that uh, we claim to, to take our people's jobs. But when we look at the kind of, of services they are rendering chairperson, maybe we can benchmark with that because we know that they are busy in the ITC sector whereby they are uh, repairing phones and stuff like that. So maybe that's the kind of, 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 of new ventures that we need to look into in terms of, of capacitating our youths uh, to, to be on par so that they'll be able to, to fill that uh, market in terms of, of the skills that uh, they are uh, going to do. To, to get from this EPW program. So I, I think I'll, I'll pause there for now, Chairperson. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, uh, honorable members of, of Honorable Franz Kalvik, and thank you um, all the honorable members for their questions that they have raised. Um, uh, without asking any question, but let me appreciate um, the road traveled so far by EPWP from what was uh, there when we came in 2019 and to where you are now. Uh, yes, uh, there may be hiccups on the way, but uh, it shows that at least there is a serious improvement, especially when you talk on the management of the whole issue. But uh, we can't uh, stop uh, raising the issue of the skills transfer and, and ensuring that we have people that can, if possible, generate their own uh, income. How are we saying that? I think what honorable, uh, uh, Graham Murray has said on the issue of maybe attracting plumbers or maybe training young people on plumbing and sometimes even to be electricians, things that even when they are no longer in the employ of the EPWP, they, those will be things that they can use in their communities so that they can have income some way or another. Um, over to you, um, CJ and, and DM, in responding to the questions and comments raised by honorable members. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And um, let, let me appreciate uh, the, the comments and the questions from the honorable members. Um, in actual fact, Chair, one could um, summarize them as um, just a few concerns uh, which are more focused on, on saying skills development, skills development, and skills development. Um, and, and I think that uh, I was hoping, CJ, you would be able to just, uh, if you have the video of our graduation, uh, share with the honorable members uh, so that they see what, what there's kind of evidence of, of what we are do, doing in the area of skills. Um, but uh, I will allow you to kind of uh, uh, take the honorable members through first the, the, the responses and I will come back uh, later um, with your team, of course. Um, if, if, if you could, whether it's uh, photographs or from the various training uh, um, institutions that we work with, but also please share the, 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 the kind of detail um, where we as, as a department are involved. Uh, I note that um, uh, Honorable um, Suisa, uh, the, 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 the point of inviting other role players in the EPWP space 
Um, I, I hope the committee will take that up because we do also get invited by other portfolio committees on matters that um, affect their departmental portfolios. So for me, um, I would, I would, um, I would uh, encourage that because um, we will then be able to also get uh, um, a, a deeper understanding of uh, what uh, programs are on the ground. But let, let me first uh, chair to you allow the team uh, to, 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 to respond to the issues and uh, I will come back uh, when, when they finish. Uh, CJ and uh, the chief directors present, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Deputy Minister, and thank you, members, for um, the, the questions. Um, let me switch on my camera. Um, I, I just want to um, know if it's possible that I could share, um, get some sharing rights. Because, Deputy Minister, I think you, you have a very valuable point, which is um, let's, let's display some of the work being done. And um, yeah, I'm going directly to our EPWP Facebook. So it might not show exactly very well in relation to um, on the screen, but I'm going to try and then go through. Uh, so yesterday was an ex amazing, exciting day for us uh, because yesterday in a very remote area, which is called Pella um, in the Northern Cape, we then had companies uh, that are in the energy sector going ahead and assisting and transferring equipment, uh, which is sewing equipment uh, to a cooperative in an, the Northern Cape, which is about 254 kilometers outside. And there are some of those uh, initiatives. We've had very exciting opportunities being undertaken in the Northern Cape in terms of skills development. I was particularly touched by the fact that our um, initiatives involve not only the private sector, but we are able to get other government organizations. So if we have a look there in the photo, and I'm not sure how it's displaying on the screen, but the Facebook can be accessed. Um, and Mereka uh, Katuso uh, in uh, the Northern Cape, which is the fund in relation to the Premier's office, also goes ahead and support economic development also supports so as the epwp we've been able to do cooperative development recognizing that our role is to bring and to coordinate as public works so there's a number of exciting initiatives that are going forth and then dm i i want to just jump forth uh, to some of the initiatives that we've had the privilege of taking you to uh, um and uh, specifically then uh, going ahead and looking at some of, uh, as DPWI, we post virtually every day, uh, which then tells us about uh, some of the exciting things that we are doing daily. But um, I want to go in and focus on our artisan development program. You can see over here, this is in the Nelspreit regional office, then took us to some of the artisan development initiatives. And here, there, these are 40 EPWP artisans, uh, people that were previously on the National Youth Service that is now being trained uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, doing various related trades. Now, the types of trades that you can look at uh, is quite extensive. And I just want to go through the trades that we are doing. We're doing boiler making, diesel mechanic, electric, fit and turner, chefs, hairdressing, carpentry, etc. And um, over the last period, what we have done is we have recognized it's important that we start to highlight the work that is being done. And so there's been this year extensive visits being undertaken where we then showcase and we then um, go ahead and we then um, we then um, we then provide um, 
the um, opportunity uh, for um, for people to be able to see the type of work being done. So that was the Yota. And I think I've jumped too fast. Uh, let me just see here quickly. We also took Deputy Minister to a recent one uh, project that I was quite excited about, uh, yes, in the Sedi Beng area. Um, and let me just scroll slightly down. That is an employer as a mentor giving us their viewpoint in relation to the trainees that are diesel mechanic trainees at Toyota Middleburg. Uh, speaking of how excited he is, there is the participant speaking about their experience in EPWP. So very often we post on our website um, in relation to the experience. So this one, there's a particular video that I'm extremely excited about um, where some of the learners then would do fitting and turning and I don't think it will work and I don't think we're going to test the system on how uh, to uh, showcase uh, this learner specifically showcases what they have learned. Now, collectively, our project is for artisan training has been a, um, a target of just over 300 um, artisans. For us, it's important that we recognize that the participant may come in through a initiative uh, that is uh, a year initiative. But for us, it is important to create that linkage and then ask the question, how do we improve the livelihoods of participants? So big questions we are then asking is, if the participant comes in for that particular year, which are the skills that our country needs that we need to be able to focus on? These types of initiatives are fairly expensive, uh, and these are rates that are determined through the Department of Higher Education and Training. And so um, we know that it is an investment, and uh, we will be tracking the participants and what happens to them afterwards. So as the department, we are very active in terms of skills development, and there are some exciting work that we will be doing that I will share further as we proceed in terms of the policy. So our Facebook is, is very explicit in some of the work we are doing, and um, we can then go ahead and uh, follow some of the interventions that we as a department are undertaking. Now, I'd like to just then focus on the questions that were then asked of me. Um, uh, Honorable Heathlin, uh, the EPWP is currently going through the process of our EPWP policy. And in that policy, we, we are saying to ourselves, we need to bring in important principles. The first principle is that we need to follow what we call a programmatic approach. And that programmatic approach is supposed to ask ourselves, what exactly are we wanting to achieve from a socioeconomic perspective? Moving beyond the numbers, asking exactly what good and service is now being delivered through this EPWP program. We recognize that not all programs will have the ability to create pathways, sustainable pathways, but we are then saying those programs that specifically have a closer alignment to the ability to do training and link it to the market, it should be explicitly stated. We recognize that the EPWP is largely an unfunded mandate, particularly because in the slides that I showcased was to show that it is the leveraging of existing funds to in order to create the work opportunities. And that will also then explain a little bit of what um, Honorable Gray Marie was asking in relation to the 30%. Mr. Ario, can I ask that you please cover that because that will explain the funding and how the targeting then works for us when we get to that. But for us, um, Honorable Hitlin, to come back, we, we are clear that the EPWP has a number of good programs. We need to write these programs up, and those programs that can be scaled up need to be scaled up. We need to create an institutional arrangement that allows us to be able to engage the Treasury Active, because our role as the coordinators is supposed to shine a light on those practices that are excellent and that are in, in need of being scaled up correctly stated that our role is to be able to assist with sustainable livelihoods. This year has also been a very exciting year for us because we've introduced, uh, or sorry, last year, the eight dimensions of quality. 
which means that programs in the EPWP will vary. But how do we go about measuring its cost effectiveness, its ability to reach uh, honorable CISWA in terms of reaching the targets of designated groups? Which are the programs and evaluating them in terms of what we call eight dimensions of quality? We then engage with the Treasury to say that that particular program, for example, National Youth Service, is efficient from a cost perspective, is efficient from an full-time equivalent perspective, which is durations. And therefore, we are thinking we would like to be able to say those are the programs that we would want to scale up. So particularly in terms of our EPWP policy, we are clearly stating that we need to bring out our programs clearly. We need to articulate that the EPWP is not just one big program. It varies. It will have home-based community care, it will have early childhood development, it will have working on fire, and these programs vary in the types of interventions you undertake. But all of them must have something in common, which is they must provide income, they must provide a work opportunity, they should be labor intensive in its uh, approach, and they should be delivering valuable services within communities. And then we go forth and we then point out those that would require even more of an investment in the EPWP in terms of training. Now, why do I say it's been an exciting process? Because this program started many, many years back. But it is good to take your EPWP policy through the various processes to have it endorsed. Because that then gets number of government departments to say it is good I see where are you, you are going with this particular policy, and I can see where we can come in to even provide further funding. And that specifically was the comment from DHET. We are working with DHET. We receive more than 200 million from them through our application of funds, which we then utilize for the artisan initiatives that I have mentioned um, and shown through our EPWP Facebook. And so we continue to work with them through the TIVITS and the community education uh, training um, centers. Um, the reason why I didn't cover uh, the, these other items in our presentation was because uh, I, I, I focused specifically on the key words that was put out in the, pre, um, in the request. But um, we can therefore uh, clearly indicate that the policy which is now at um, uh, the cabinet stage today, it is um, serving at cabinet, I'm told, um, uh, I trust it is, uh, seeing that I'm, I'm not at the cabinet uh, because of, of who attends. Um, but to recognize that it is now at a level whereby we have to ask for public comment um, and therefore it will be gazetted very shortly. The journey of the policy was also exciting because it allowed us to engage the constituencies, the private sector, the community, and labor. And in February month and March, sorry, March month, uh, we took uh, the constituencies uh, to various provinces, the Western Cape, the Northwest province, and Limpopo province. And we showed them the variety of the EPWP programs. And it was quite exciting in the sense of, I don't know which honorable uh, member then asked on the private sector involvement. Uh, honorable Van Skalkwijk was uh, mentioning it. Um, uh, it was then to be able to then get commitments from NEDLAC constituencies on how business can engage us better, specifically for business to advise on what are the skills required by the private sector, to ask how they can assist us, because this program was never intended to only be a program implemented by government. It was supposed to be with all constituencies that made GDS um, commitments in relation to that process. So a task team has been set up where all constituencies now are answering the question during this policy development year that we are in to even say, how do we strengthen this EPWP more and ask what exactly the private sector must do, how um, uh, we can deal with exploitation uh, and how the uh, community can help us to strengthen the social facilitation aspects of the EPWP. So that 
task team has been adopted and it is work being done through the EP, the development chamber of uh, NEDLAC. And so we are very excited because we've been proactive in relation to the policy development process, recognizing that you only go to NEDLAC after you have gone through the gazetting process. And so for us, it was important to have a policy that is therefore reflective of uh, these objectives that we were wanting, as mentioned, income support, work opportunities, skills transfer, SMME development, et cetera. The policy also speaks to all of those aspects. If I can then move on uh, more speedily, in relation to, and Mr. Aria will answer some of those questions in relation to what Honorable uh, Marie has asked, if I have not covered it. Um, uh, in terms of the EPWP reporting process, uh, for us to recognizing that the incentive grant is only 8% of all EPWP funding, we are very explicit. We put out an incentive. The first thing we start out with is the DORA conditions. So the conditional grant framework puts out very clearly what needs to happen from a reporting perspective. Before any drawdowns can happen, a project has to be reported on our EPWP reporting system, and therefore they then would be getting what you then call a, a, a project um, ID uh, profile, and that then gets monitored for the entire year. Mr. Aria then has monthly meetings. Mr. Ario then has monthly meetings that then goes ahead and monitors uh, those particular projects that are put forth in relation to um, the incentive grant funding. In terms of the threshold for admin, it is 5% of the grant can be used to fund contract-based capacity requirements. In relation to the community work program, the community work program has been uh, amending its program, particularly from a policy perspective. Um, they are of the opinion that it is more work opportunity related and, and not necessarily as much as the skilling focus. Um, it is therefore important that we continue to engage them. I think the important question that always comes up with training is the issue of training. Um, uh, do you expand on the training and uh, instead of creating more opportunities and work opportunities? We know that our country has 11 million SRD participants and the Treasury has come to us to say, can we assist? to be able to transfer and have some people undertake some meaningful work uh, in relation to receiving that particular grant. Um, so what we therefore recognize is that there's always this tug of war between do you upscale the number of work opportunities or do you invest in training? And there's no simple answer for that, but to say that if the EPWP is going to then link with the employability of the participant. Training is relevant, it's very vital. And so therefore, it is important that we recognize that training in itself can be capacity building and also add to the participant's livelihood. And, um, and, and therefore, we looked at some of the models, and I don't have too much time to be able to go into those models, um, whereby we've partnered with organizations such as um, the Labor International Labor Organization, and we took it one step further this year, where we've asked them that some of our DPWI officials are able to accredit even more trainers. And these trainers are government officials, because what we are saying is when a government official visits a project, you can't just go and visit a project just for visiting a project and looking at the accountability of the project. You need to go and impart skills. And that is the model that we've applied with our start and improve your own business. And those are some of the examples that I showed you in terms of the Pella example of small business development. So we've upscaled the model and it's, and it's a bit difficult to go into the detail now in terms of it. But what we are recognizing is that capacitation is also vital to be able to move our participants into uh, SMME development aspects. And it's not about sometimes going through a learnership. Sometimes it's about going through uh, the process of a 
assisting participants to develop the small, the business plan, to be able to engage stakeholders to have certain aspects funded of the business plan, et cetera, et cetera. And that is the work we specifically do as the DPWI in an effort to help with the bakeries we've established in EPWP, the agricultural organizations that we've established. And some of these participants are actually supplying government. So there's definitely a good story to tell in relation to it. So yes, DWP is busy transforming at the moment. They've even gone through organizational change over the last period. The verification process, I think um, I can go through it, but I would want Mayor Tembake, um, Tembakazi Malaleka rather to go through it. Uh, she's the director in terms of uh, data quality and reporting. Uh, if we then move further, um, for us, uh, we are busy today, actually, um, we're putting out a framework on persons with disabilities. We want to enhance our participation of persons with disabilities. However, we recognize that we need to assist public bodies to understand how to do so. Um, we, we recognize that when, when you do uh, try to upscale the number of uh, persons with disabilities, you need to look at reasonable accommodation uh, matters. You, you, you need to look at the suitability also, and also how you engage uh, organizations that are within that particular sector. So we are busy putting forth, uh, we've developed the draft framework, and now we're consulting with the public bodies to make sure that they see it uh, to be fit for adoption and fit for use. Um, in terms of the um, exploitation, um, exploitation of EPWP, uh, I think measures that we are doing there is for us, it's important for us to provide technical support to public bodies, uh, to clearly guide them on uh, how to design EPWP. We also undertake public body visits to be able to deal with those particular matters. And the reality of it is we encourage public bodies to access the law. If somebody breaks the law, you need to make sure that as per the Basic Conditions of Employment Act, there are measures to be able to highlight that to the Department of Labor and therefore utilizing our uh, uh, labor inspectors that is not only for EPWP, but for the broader economy. In terms of uh, the work seeker component, the ESA component, um, May Timbakazi Luleke will take us through that particular one. Um, and then in terms of the allocations, particularly within terms of the Division of Revenue Act, Mr. Ario will explain that, but that would follow the normal process in relation to the appropriations uh, bill, and you would then go ahead um, and, and um, uh, follow the same Treasury processes in relation to that, noting that EPWP funding is about uh, leveraging in relation to uh, the program. Um, let me just see if there's anything else. In terms of the roads, Mr. Ario can also um, advise us in terms of the roads, mentioning specifically that the MIG funding is where we leverage and we introduce labor intensive measures. Now to come to Honorable Tring, um, uh, Mayor Timbakazi Malaleka will go through the criteria for reporting. Um, uh, will the municipality have the capacity to comply? As mentioned, we provide technical support to municipalities. Uh, Mr. Ario can advise us on the extent of that. Um, we uh, also provide a EPWP learning program. So if I had to go back uh, and I had to share then uh, some of uh, the interventions, um, we had about 200 people being trained last week. This is something that my uh, our branch as the EPWP goes ahead and actually um, implements so that we can, um, and there you would find some of the EPWP participants uh, being uh, trained on what the EPWP is about. You can see many of them are young people. I see them as the future EPWP leaders. And if we go forth, we will even see uh, some of the testimonials that we then have in relation to the EPWP learning program. So that was one of the ladies that then spoke about the EPWP learning program and the interventions and the gentleman speaking about this. This happened last week for a week 
Um, so if we just then look at the 25th of August, uh, that's when some of the videos were uploaded. Um, May uh, Maluleka, I think that is some interesting proposal from um, um, Honorable Tring, uh, particularly recognizing that we are migrating um, the public bodies from our current version, which is version one, to this version two. And we have in the past not decommissioned that particular um, platform. And it has come to be of benefit, particularly when um, you have had system challenges. So I think um, we, we may have to say that you don't want to fully decommission that phase one, because um, I think it could be uh, assisting us even in the future. So I think that is is something that I would have been faced with in terms of once we have fully migrated everybody, that May Maluleka may have asked that question, what do we do with the system? Um, depending on if she says it's still viable to maintain it and to keep it, depending on the cost, because we're all uh, subject to the PFMA, I think it is a good suggestion to try and um, retain it. Um, then if we then uh, go further, um, um, Honorable Michelle, um, uh, Michelle, I think we have uh, responded to you um, in relation to the skilling component and the exploitation, uh, and then in terms of the compliance with the system. Um, the intent, the incentive grant process is a very intensive process. So on, it's, it's a regular engagement with public bodies. It starts out with the public body. First of all, we have workshops with public bodies to explain to them what is the requirement uh, in terms of the incentive grant. We therefore go ahead and we also then say to them, they must provide us with a project list related to it. We provide technical support in compiling that particular list. Um, every month in terms of the Division of Revenue Act, there needs to be a reporting, which we then put through the National Treasury. And then if there is a challenge, we monitor on our system who reports regularly. And if there is, uh, we see there's no movement on the reporting, we then intervene through our EPWP officials to ensure the reporting. So there's a very intensive process, which is uh, the engagement with the public body and the engagement with the Treasury. We tend to have a very a high performance from a grant perspective in relation to our, our, our grants. Um, Honorable Van Skalkvik, um, I, I think we, we have uh, recognized the importance here of the skills. And, and for me, I'm very excited about the work that we are doing on the skilling front, particularly the skills that really aim to be able to take people totally out of EPWP and into the labor market and hopefully then never come back to an EPWP and therefore have the multiplier effects not only in the community, but also then go ahead and assist from a household perspective in relation to it. Um, I think, Chair, we have uh, looked at uh, the skills transfer question that you've asked. And if I can just ask then Mr. Ario to come in and then me, um, Timbakazi Maluleka to also come in to be able to explain. And I think the last question was, um, Honorable Marie, the question that we were wanting to have is we want uh, oversight from uh, with other public bodies. And we, we would like those questions to be also then asked to the relevant accounting authorities uh, so that collectively we recognize that this program is more than DPWI, but it does involve other stakeholders too. And all of us need to account to the laws of our country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Abrahams. Uh, my name is Ignatius Ayrio. I'm from the Department of Public Works and Infrastructure. I'll just help with some of the questions. Um, um, Honorable Deputy Minister, um, Honorable Chairperson of the Committee, um, Honorable Members of the Portfolio Committee of uh, Public Works and Infrastructure, officials supporting the Portfolio Committee, and uh, colleagues from the Department of Public Works. Good morning. Um, just to answer some of the questions that were put through, um, a Honorable um, uh, Mary, Graham Mary asked a question about the thresholds. I think that has been answered in terms of the incentive grant, that 5% um, is, is the cap in terms of the admin costs, and that includes a non-permanent staff and maybe and even equipment, if you need uh, equipment like computers for capturing of data. 
uh, in terms of the question about the 30% on the MIG budgets, the estimate and the 25%, that is just the, the 25 or 30% of MIG uh, refers to the overall budget of the MIG grant that we estimate would be used for EPWP projects overall. But you would find that in a particular public body, uh, the projects they may be implementing in a particular financial year may be suitable, may all be suitable for EPWP. So in that case, uh, most of the projects then would be regarded as EPWP. So 30% is just a minimum threshold that we, we work towards in terms of the overall MIG budget. Specifically, in terms of the question, how much of that goes to labor? Um, we have labor intensive guidelines, um, and we try to aim that um, between 20 uh, to, to 30 percent of project costs should go to labor. That's what we target in terms of labor intensity. But this depends on the nature of the project being implemented. On some maintenance projects, you may find even up to 70 percent of the project costs going to labor. So the minimum threshold we try to work towards is uh, about 20 percent uh, that of, of the project costs should go towards labor if we are doing it labor intensively. Uh, but it depends on the type of project that is being done because you will still have to have material costs, uh, costs of equipment, uh, and things like that. Um, in terms of the, there was a question asked us about public bodies that don't comply. Um, Ms. Abrahams answered that we do training. Uh, we have workshops with the public bodies in cases where they are not compliant. We'd have a one on one meeting with the public body uh, to ensure that they comply. Uh, maybe uh, there may be a report that they are not submitting in terms of the grant uh, so that to ensure that they comply. Uh, we try to avoid. Um, a uh, stopping of the allocations that is the the last resort uh that will come um in very rare circumstances we we've had to stop uh, allocations but we told for the past financial year it only happened to uh, one public body two public bodies actually and then uh, we had to in that case we had to reallocate the funding uh, to other uh, municipalities is that would, would be performing well and that have also uh, indicated that they would need additional funding. But that is the very last result. What we do is the training in terms of the compliance requirements and also we provide technical support to ensure that the public bodies. So I was asked also how do we ensure that the public bodies use the system uh, for the incentive grant projects? Um, for the incentive grant projects, we do have a project list that public bodies are supposed to submit with their incentive grant agreements. One of the requirements on that project list is that they're supposed to provide for us um, a profile ID number of a project. So every project has a unique profile ID number, and it is a condition on that project list that you, you have to register your project on the monitoring system. And then that will generate um, a profile ID number that you will then include on the project list. It then becomes easy for the department to monitor whether a particular project is being reported because we would have the unique profile ID number. So that's what we do in order to make sure that um, public bodies um, 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 use the system. And you need to submit, it's a condition of the grant that you submit a, a incentive agreement with the with a properly filled project list before we transfer any funding uh, to a particular public body. Um, then another question was asked by uh, Honorable uh, Spisa uh, in terms of uh, the, um, the what are the conditions for the grant. Uh, in terms of the, the, with the particular conditions for the grant to be eligible, uh, you need to have reported in a prior financial year uh, reported on EPWP. Also on the projects that you have reported, you need to have created a 13 full-time equivalents per million rand of expenditure. And the reason why we have that threshold of 13 full-time equivalents, um, and a full-time equivalent is, is the same as one, uh, um, one, one full-time equivalent 
is the same as 230 person years of employment is because we're encouraging public bodies to be very efficient when they use their funding to create work opportunities, to create long-term uh, um, um, uh, uh, opportunities, but also have the right labor intensity. And the reason why we look at the full-time equivalent is because one of the functions of the full-time equivalent, it looks at the duration of the work opportunity. Uh, so that if you have longer durations, you then have more full-time equivalents. And what that means that um, participants will be employed on a project for a longer duration, which will then ensure that they, they, there is a longer period for transfer of income to them, which makes a difference in terms of their livelihoods. Um, so that also answers the question as public bodies to have longer duration in terms of their projects. Also, in terms of the formula for the grant, um, the, the formula is best towards a rural look at whether the municipality or the public bodies in a rural area will there is also a bias towards uh, backlogs in a particular area. There's also a bias towards um, areas of unemployment. So you would see like in the allocations of the provincial uh, grant, uh, integrated grant, uh, you see that the provinces that get most of the funding are the rural, uh, provinces, it would be KwaZulu and those are provinces with a lot of uh, rural populations that get most of the funding. And for municipalities as well, we would say that uh, there's a bias that the rural municipalities uh, as, an, as, as an aggregate get most of the funding. And that is because we want to promote um, job creation in those, in those areas. Then in terms of the provincial roads made into roads departments, and that is something that we monitor together with the Department of Transport, because this funding goes to the Department of Transport, Department of Transport then um, a, a, a transfers funding to this provincial roads department. So together with the Department of Transport, we monitor the, imp the implementation of the funding. We also uh, ensure that the projects that are funded through the grant uh, that the public bodies or provincial roads departments optimize on the EPWP projects they're implementing and report on the projects as well. For municipalities, we rely on the, it is through the big funding, uh, MIG covers a variety of infrastructure, roads is included in the big funding. Uh, so out of the MIG funding, some of it goes to roads, some of it goes to water reticulation. Uh, so the funding uh, would go through the MIG funding for municipalities. Um, in, in terms of EPWP. Um, those are some of the responses, additional responses I could give uh, in terms of the different areas. Uh, thank you very much. Any other person, CJ, who's going to respond? Uh, yes, Chair, it will be Timbakazi Maluleka. Okay, thank you, Ms. Maluleka, please. Um, thank you, DG. Um, good morning to the Honorable Minister, the Department of Public Works, the Chairperson of the Portfolio Committee, the members of the Portfolio Committee, and all protocols observed. Uh, Chairperson, I'm going to respond to questions related to the EPWP reporting system. Uh, data management and our linkage to the ESSA system of the Department of Employment and Labor. Please allow me to start with the ESSA system. Um, as the department, we acknowledge that the system is an online recruitment system, which is owned by the Department of Employment and Labor, and uh, this system is available to all South African citizens. It's a work seekers uh, database which acts as an intermediation between the job seeker as well as the employers, which means that the system allows for the registration of job seekers, and it also allows for the registration of employers. Uh, as the department, we understand that the system has been in existence for quite some time. Um, we also know or have knowledge that the Department of Employment and Labor has um, set up some access centers in all the nine departments, in all the nine provinces rather, um, to assist or support job seekers who do not have access uh, to technology. We therefore, as the department, um, took the advantage 
to have an initiative of linking the EPWP reporting system with the ESSA system uh, for purposes of augmenting the current exit strategies that the department is implementing with regards to EPWP uh, participants. The linkage will be automated, um, which means that the EPWP participants do not have to physically register themselves on the system or take the initiative to get their details registered on the system. It will be an automated process. Uh, we will do that through the profiles which have been created in the EPWP reporting system. We understand that when it comes to reporting, we report um, detailed information on the program uh, in terms of the projects which are implemented as well as the participants who are working in those uh, projects. We therefore have the information of the participants who are in EPWP projects. The profiles include the contact details of these participants. We therefore will interface with the ESSA system and transfer that information from the EPWP reporting system into the ESSA system um, to, 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 to create those profiles. We understand that there are some requirements with the Department of Labor in order to create a CV on the system we are as the department in the process of communicating with the public bodies to source all that information so that we can allow our participants to have um, more opportunities um, accessible to them when they exit the EPWP program. Um, that is the, the initiative that we are currently undertaking, Chairperson, and we, 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 we understand that it will be of great benefit, especially to the EPWP participants. There was a question which was raised um, um, about this um, interface with the, with, with the ESSA system. Um, some of the questions were relating to whether the, uh, the public bodies or the participants have been made aware of this initiative. And um, I've explained how it's going to work. It, is, it will be an automated process. Uh, the participants will not have to register themselves on the system, but the department will take that initiative of creating their profiles in the ESSA system so that when an opportunity arises um, from the Department of Labor's matching uh, system, then those participants will be informed through the contacts that they have provided to the EPWP. We have informed um, the, 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 the departments. We are still in that process because this is an initiative that we currently have undertaken um, in the current financial year. We're still in the process of, 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 of finalizing and also ensuring that all the participants who are in the program are made aware of that initiative. And then in terms of the reporting system initiatives, which um, has been presented by the DDG of the EPWP. Yes, we are in the process of migrating participants from an older version of the system to a more advanced system, which includes the features which have been presented in the presentation, um, some of which are the biometrics tool. We believe that it will be of great benefit uh, to the program in terms of improving the quality of data that we are collecting um, from the sites where the programs are or the projects are implemented. We believe that it will also be of assistance in terms of accuracy of the information that we are reporting to and, the, uh, and also realize um, the validity of the information. We are currently uh, linked with the National uh, Population Register of the Department of Home Affairs, which means that the ID numbers or the participants rather that we are reporting are indeed um, valid uh, participants. The ID numbers are valid, and we are also able to eliminate um, participants who have diseased from the project, um, how, from the program. However, we want to ensure that the work opportunities that are reported are indeed valid, and therefore the initiative to take or implement the biometrics tool on the EPWP reporting system. We are currently um, running a parallel system. I think there was a question that was related to, to that. Yes, we, we, we have two systems and um, in the process of migrating, we want to ensure that before we migrate all the public bodies into the new system, there is some form of stability. We do not fall on the cracks and therefore we are taking a phased in approach, which means that we are running two systems at the same time. Uh, moving one sphere of government at a time. We've currently finalized uh, the national and the provincial spheres. We are having the municipalities outstanding, which means that the municipalities are still reporting in the old system. We are intending to retain that system as a backup. And uh, yes, um, um, we take the advice as well from the members. Um, it is an initiative that we have planned because these are systems which are owned by the department. I want to believe that I have answered all the questions. Chair, if there are any follow-ups, I am more than willing to respond to those questions. Thank you.
Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. I, I take it that CJ, you, your team has now exhausted uh, their responses. Uh, mine is to just uh, round out by um, emphasizing two issues that uh, I, I have I've felt not uh, addressed in totality in the questions. The one is, is that of communicating. Do people really know what you're doing? Yes, um, we, we have improved our own internal processes and systems of communication um, through our change program. There, there has been lull in the past, but I can, I can assure you now uh, honorable members that just by visiting our own uh, websites and uh, our um, program uh, sites, you will be able to see the extent to which uh, communication does take place. And therefore there is uh, communication through social media, but also there are media briefings uh, from time to time as we go around uh, uh, as ambassadors of the work that is being done by the department. We do hold uh, from time to time um, media briefings so that uh, people are informed, but also we physically go to communities uh, with a view to um, share with communities our programs. Uh, each time we go to um, site visits, uh, our monitoring and uh, evaluation role, when we play it, um, we, we really treat ourselves as, as ambassadors of the work of, of, of departments. But also, there's greater collaboration now with all departments um, uh, through the push that uh, public works, you can't do it alone, especially that it is not only your own program but you are coordinating it on behalf of others. So you need to collaborate more with them. Just yesterday, I, I happened to look at the, at the what, uh, Facebook of, of, of Buffalo City. And there was uh, the Department of Employment and Labor um, also advocating for the same program as part of the, 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 the collaboration work that we are doing with the departments. And therefore there is um, greater communication now with people. And I, 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 I would say just being on this platform, when I started speaking, I said, I, I'm, I'm happy that the, the, the honorable members have posed this question uh, for us to come and respond to uh, not only the committee, but to the people of South Africa, because these programs are also broadcast live. And therefore, just by mere uh, uh, responding to your questions, the information is uh, shared with the public. So we, 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 we do try and uh, through collaboration, communicate, uh, but also through our own programs, we do communicate. I, I thought we needed to, to say this um, because indeed uh, this program is not only about numbers, that, that's what I had uh, initially uh, said when I initially spoke, that it is a program about ensuring that we build, um, we contribute to building a cohesive, um, uh, communities, um, because when communities are, when there's much unemployment, um, people become disillusioned. But with opportunities that are being brought about by this program, um, it, it, it's the, the nature of the program, how it is driven, uh, forces communities to work together, uh, forces um, councillors who also are our advocates now uh, in terms of them working with their communities 
um, when implementing programs of EPWP. So them also being our communicators, but we all contribute to building this uh, uh, united and uh, democratic, uh, prosperous South Africa. I know that uh, these are not full-time jobs, uh, Honorable Suiza, and I know that you are passionate about seeing a situation where these become um, permanent jobs. But uh, public employment jobs in their nature um, create a, a stepping stones. In, in fact, um, what Honorable uh, Hickling was saying we're not doing, it's, 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 we are actually doing exactly that. We are creating those stepping stones for uh, the members of the people, especially the vulnerable, to be able to step on those stones uh, to build the, the future, but also to be able um, which is uh, to ensure that their livelihoods um, are taken care of. And, and um, I thought I needed to just round up by those uh, words, Honorable Chairperson, uh, but once more, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, DM, and uh, thank you, uh, Ms. CJ and, and your team, and also responding um, in detail on the questions and comments that have been raised by honorable members. I saw, uh, but now it's no longer there. I saw honorable Tring's hand. I don't know whether it was a follow-up question or a, a, a legacy hand. Legacy hand, Chair, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, honorable Tring. Um, we really appreciate um, DM. Uh, that when we pose questions, because as we have indicated so clearly so, we want South African people to know what is happening. I think we all know that EPWP is one of the programs that we can find in each and every corner of South Africa. So as us who are playing oversight role on you as members of the parliament from different political parties, we all people of South Africa, this information that you have presented to them today. We really appreciate that. Um, I think now we will, um, our, um, our item on the agenda, though the agenda was not flighted, I don't know whether you do have the, the minutes of the previous meeting. Um, Chipper, can I ask um, Sita Biso to, to flight in because I do not have them? Okay. Yes, chair. Yes, chair. Will... yes, we do not have the agenda for this for this meeting and the minutes as well. So Nola did not send it through, so we do not have it for this meeting. Chair. Okay, okay, okay. No problems. Uh, I thought that because we still have time, we can deal with that, but um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's no trends match. We will deal with them in the, in the next meeting. Um, honorable members, again, uh, let me appreciate your robust debate and contribution in this meeting and the responses that we got from the department when we probed uh, them with these questions. We really appreciate that. Uh, if we don't have any other matter, then on the agenda, I declare the meeting agent. Thank you. See you Thank in you the chair. Thank you, Chair. Recording the chair. Thank you. Thank you, honorable members.
being brought about by this program. Um, it, it, it's the, the nature of the program, how it is driven, uh, forces communities to work together, uh, forces um, councillors who also are our advocates now uh, in terms of them working with their communities, um, our communicators. But we all contribute and uh, these are not full-time jobs. Seeing the honorable to be able. Thank you, uh, Ms. CJ and, and your team. And also responding, um, I, I saw honorable coffee. We can find this one. Okay, okay, okay. No problems, uh, I thought that because we still have that. Uh, if we don't have any other matter then on the agenda, I declare the meeting agent. Thank you. See you in the Thank you, Thank you, Honorable Member.